During my presentation at Roots Tech 2015, I mentioned that I'd record my presentation so that those of you attending, and those of you who couldn't attend, could watch the not-so-instant replay. I'm Tessa Keo, and this is Who Does That? An Introduction to One Name Studies. February 2015 is now almost 12 weeks in the past. It was my first time attending Roots Tech and my first time presenting at Roots Tech. I found the experience inspiring, educational, exhausting, and lots of fun. Just last week, I presented at the Legacy Webinar Wednesday on specialized studies. A one-name study is perhaps the best known of these types of studies. If you're wondering about one-name studies, I hope this presentation provides a bit of food for thought answers some of your questions, and perhaps even helps you get started with a one-name study. So, let's get started. For those of you who attended, and those who may have watched the opening keynote, the major themes everyone kept coming back to at Roots Tech were connecting, collaborating, and sharing. Dennis Brimhall read from Darris Williams' letter where he described how he found his extended family by using records from each of the major online genealogy providers Ancestry, Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And he showed us that being willing to research from a variety of resources will help us make those family connections. I met Darris early in the week. The Colt family that he's researching is a registered one name study, and much of his research is online at the Family Search Family Tree. I was impressed to see that Ancestry and Family Search are working together to digitize and index the Mexican records. This is a real boon for those studying their Mexican heritage and should make conducting a one name study with Mexican surnames that much easier. And the demonstration of that Discovery Center app was a great visual way to share information about surname meanings, origin, and migration. Sharing our genealogy research, either on a self-hosted tree or on any of the provider-hosted trees, is a great way to share our discoveries and our family history story. During the next 50 minutes, we'll discuss the concepts of surname research and aspects of one name studies. You might want to download the PDF session syllabus for this presentation or any of the other 200 sessions found at the rootstech.org website. Click on the About tab and the 2015 class syllabus materials. Those who attended the live presentation received a tent card with some information about the Guild of One Name Studies, a surname card, and a worksheet for this session. I'll post a link to the PDF versions of the worksheet and the tent card at my YouTube channel if you'd like to follow along. But first, let's get started by finding out a bit more about each other. Have you researched your own family back two generations, your parents and grandparents? Have you gone further and researched your own family back three or four generations, your great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents? Have you gone even further and researched your own family back more than four generations? Almost 50% of those who attended the live session at Roots Tech had researched their families back three to four generations. Do you use a genealogy management program or an online tree facility to record your research? About 75% of those who attended used either a computer-based genealogy management program or kept their family trees online. Whatever software or websites we use to record our family history, we try to include as much information about each person in our tree to get a sense of who they were and how they lived. What types of things do you include in your family history research? I've listed a few here. We include pieces of information such as given name, surname, birth, baptism, education, occupation, marriage, children, census, residence, death, and burial. And each of you probably have several more facts or events you could add to this list. 
How many surnames have you come across in your direct line family research? This is my paternal pedigree. As you can see, I have eight surnames listed here. And this is my maternal pedigree. Again, I have eight surnames. Have you included information about any of your surnames in your family history research? If not, why not? For many of us, it's because while we're busy searching for names, dates, documents, and images, we tend to skip right past the oldest possession each person in our family has, their surname and the story it tells. On the worksheet, you'll notice the top section. Whether you use it or a blank sheet of paper, take a moment to write up to 16 surnames of your direct lines into that top section. And just do this from memory. No need to use smartphones or tablets, just the computer that's between your ears. Today we're going to talk about why adding surname research to your family history is interesting, may provide you with clues for further research, and might just get you started on a one-name study. Most of us have engaged in substantial genealogy research. Several of us have gone back four or more generations. But a one-name study might be new to you, so I think it's important to understand the differences between them. The best analogy I can think of is train stations. I view genealogy and family history as a single-track train station through a small town. It's focused, narrow, and convergent. With genealogy, we're always dismissing most resources and sources to find those few sources and records that refer to our direct line. Genealogy is the process of filtering to be exclusive. On the other hand, I view a one-name study as a busy train station in a major city. Think Grand Central Station in New York City. There are many tracks going in several directions and it's divergent. With a one-name study, all sources and records are relevant. If the surname occurs in an index, a record, a newspaper article, or on a gravestone, we want to include it in our study. And if genealogy is the process of filtering to be exclusive, a one-name study is the process of gathering to be inclusive. There's a bonus here you always get to do the genealogy happy dance when you have a one-name study. Finding others with the same surname is an embarrassment of riches. So what exactly is a one-name study? Simply put, it's a project where you study a surname, looking for its origin and meaning, and collecting all occurrences of that surname from various records and resources. In addition, one-name researchers analyze the data to answer questions or come to some preliminary conclusions about any number of topics related to their surname. Most often, a one-name study starts out in a local area, expands to a region or country, and at some point for true one-namers, their study goes global. Now that we've touched upon what a one-name study is, you might be asking, why are people interested in learning more about their surnames? Or why engage in a one-name study? I think we saw from the Family Searches Discovery app demo that it's simply interesting to find out the meaning of a given name and a surname, as well as its origin and migration. That demo was really well done, and it was an entertaining visual. I think we all enjoy the idea of the Museum of Me that Dennis Brimhall showed us. Now, perhaps you've gotten stuck with your genealogy and thought if you collected additional instances of your surname, you might find a connection. Or you've met others who share your surname and wondered if you were, somewhere down the line, distantly related. Or you've carried your own line of that surname both back and forth and finished the search. Perhaps you want a new challenge. You might enjoy reconstructing families. You might be interested in the DNA aspect of family history that has absolutely exploded in the past few years, and you want to learn if we really are connected somehow to a larger family tree. Or perhaps you simply want to apply your research skills outside your own personal family history.
Since one name studies include lots of data gathering from a number of countries' records, we're in a position to ask questions, do the necessary analysis, and add value to the field of surname research. Most one-name researchers enjoy learning about the geography, history, language, and culture associated with researching our surname in countries all over the world. And several of us enjoy the methodology and nerdy, numbers-crunching aspect of a one-name study. In my case, I started doing a one-name study before I even knew there was such a thing, or that others were doing it too. In the summer of 2009, I traveled to Newfoundland on the spur of the moment. I got a flyer about a research trip through the New England Historic and Genealogical Society. My paternal grandfather was born and raised in a small community in Newfoundland. I knew his birth date, birthplace, and religion. My father never asked any questions about his father's family, not about his grandparents, his aunts and uncles, or where the family was originally from. I'd done a bit of research, but there weren't many records online, so I thought, why not go there, do some research, try to find out which of the Keos in Newfoundland we were related to, whether we had any living family members still there, and hopefully learn enough so that I could figure out how to cross the pond to Ireland on the Keo side. I met with the archivist at the Archives of Newfoundland, and she pointed out the various record collections, including the Roman Catholic Church records for the Bonavista region. And those were photocopies of handwritten parish entries made over a 150-year period. When I got the file box, I noticed it had a use sticker on the lid. Researchers were not allowed to photocopy, scan, or photograph the records. Researchers could read and transcribe the records, either by hand or by computer. I knew this would probably be my one opportunity to review these records, frankly because of the cost associated with the trip. So I quickly determined that I had to transcribe the records from my grandfather's community and surrounding communities, and to transcribe them for all the residents, because I didn't know who married in or married out of the Keogh family, and I didn't want to miss anyone who might turn out later to be related. I knew I could supplement the church records with the census, voting, tax, and land records that I could photograph and photocopy. The absolute best use of my time was in data collection, both at the archives, government offices, university libraries, as well as interviews with families I visited in Plate Cove East. While there, and after the archives had closed for the day, I did some internet searches. I was looking for the best method to gather data, work on a community project, and do surname research. And all those searches kept coming up with the same results. Links to the Guild of One Name Studies, individual surname websites and blogs, community in one place studies, and surname forums. Luckily for me, and I thought it would be the case, someone had already invented that wheel, and the various websites provided enough information to point me in the right direction. It appeared that I was doing a one name study with a bit of a one-place study thrown in, and the websites explained how to get started. Actually, we're all doing a one-name study, whether we realize it or not. Some of us study the surname only as it relates to our own family. Others gather instances of the surname that we find in our local and surrounding areas. A few gather instances of the surname from the area our original ancestor was from, and some of us we just can't help ourselves. Once we get started, we look for our surname in every record set we encounter. Now, there are a few terms and concepts that might be new to you, and as they come up, I'll explain them. The URLs for the websites I mention, as well as for over two dozen others, are included on the worksheet, together with a brief description of why you might want to visit that website. And my YouTube channel, Tessa Watch, has several videos about particular aspects of one name studies, and I plan to add several more this year that focus on methodology and how to use various resources and record sets. Now, there are two parts to a one name study. The first part is researching the surname, its meaning, its variance, through time and space. 
And the second part is sharing that research with others and adding to the general knowledge of the genealogy community, perhaps connecting up those who share the surname in a series of unrelated family trees, or if the surname is relatively uncommon, in one related family tree. Surnames are used throughout the world, and they're our calling card. Whether we hand someone a genealogy or business card, or we reach out and shake hands, we introduce ourselves by telling each other our name. That simple introduction often tells each party something about the other. It gives a name to the unique person that you are, as well as identifying who, and oftentimes, where you come from. I knew that on my father's side, our surnames are Irish, and on my mother's side, our surnames are Norwegian, Swedish, and Slovenian. DNA might tell me a different, or at least a more extensive story, but this is enough to get me started with my surname research. Take a look at the surnames you listed on your worksheet. Do you have any idea where they originated? Many times we have an idea from immigration records or citizenship papers, or perhaps the answer appears in response to a census question. Why not write down the countries beside each surname, or make your best guess? Go ahead and pause the recording. I'll wait. As to how surnames originated, they can be broken down into four main categories personal, locative, occupational, and descriptive. Personal surnames are based on a parent's given name, often found in Scandinavian countries. They can be patronymic, based on a father's given name, or matronymic, based on a mother's given name. An example would be Lars' son or Lars' daughter. Locative surnames are based on location or topography. The surname is based on a feature of the land, trees, the city or town name, farm names, nearby rivers or mountains. A person is identified with a place. Some examples are Red Hill, Bradford, Hall, and Monkhouse. Occupational surnames are based on what a person does or their rank. Some examples are Baker, Shepherd, Draper, Shoemaker, Smith, and Knight. And finally, descriptive surnames are based on a person's appearance, temperament or behavior, and sometimes nicknames. Some examples are Black, Whitehead, Fox, Abello, Italian for Little Bee, or Bichard, French for Gossip. Now let's take another look at the surnames on your worksheet. Do any of them fit into one of these categories? And I use PLOD for short. P -L -O -D. Why not write down the initial that indicates your surname's type? Did you find any personal surnames? Did you find any locative surnames? Did you find any occupational surnames? Did you find any descriptive surnames? And are there some surnames on your worksheet that you have no idea which category they might fit? The primary surname in a one-name study is the surname with the exact spelling that you've decided to study. In my case, that is the surname Keo, spelled K-E-O-U-G-H. A variant surname usually results from a decision to modify the spelling based on migration or language. Oftentimes a variant results from a spelling change that's made on purpose and over time. The surname Keo is spelled differently in separate parts of Ireland. K-E-O-U-G-H, K-E-O-G-H, and K-E-H-O-E. -E. The most common spellings of the surname Keo in the United States are K-E-H-O-E -E and K-E-O-G-H. As a result, my one name study includes the primary surname of Keo with my spelling as well as those two variants. A deviant surname, on the other hand, usually is the result of a temporary version of a surname arising from an error, perhaps it was misheard based on an accent, or misspelled based on a person's language, spelling, or handwriting. Or perhaps the surname was written incorrectly by a civil or church clerk. We study a surname through time because our surname is not static, and more importantly, 
the times, aka history, has affected all those who have shared our surname. We conduct a one name study to learn when and where our surname first appeared, to find out whether there are more people with our surname today than there were at various points in history, and to determine how many people share our surname today. We study a surname through space. For most of us, our surname has not stood still. Wherever it started out, it has migrated to other regions, countries, and continents. We conduct a one-name study to learn where our surname began, to map where our surname has traveled, and to find out where our surname resides today. We're going to take a quick look at four resources that are free and will give us some basic information about the origin, meaning, distribution, and frequency of our surnames. And they're listed on your worksheet. Our first stop is World Names Public Profiler. This website is a project from the Geography Department at University College London and the University of Liverpool. There are over 8 million surnames from 26 countries represented. This is a jumping off point because this project represents only about 13% of the world's countries. But if your surname can be mapped on this website, lots of preliminary information is available. Let's take a look. You simply type in the surname and the website generates a distribution map and some tables with information. As we can see, the Keo surname is most frequent in Canada, the United States, Australia, Ireland, the UK, and Argentina. Now that last one was new to me. We can also drill down to a continent, a country, and specific provinces or states by clicking on the interactive map. Public Profiler provides the roots of the surname as well as top countries, regions, and cities where the surname is found. It confirms that today the Keo surname is found most frequently in the Maritimes provinces of Canada, and it shows Plate Cove East and West as two of the top five cities. Now they're actually small fishing communities, but Plate Cove is where my Keos are from. Our second stop is americansurnames.us. This is a great site to use because so many American surnames are actually surnames from all over the world. We are a nation of immigrants. There's also a sister site for British surnames. You can get a quick snapshot of detailed numbers from census statistics, including the frequency of the surname in the United States as of the 2000 census and the 1880 census. You can also see the total number, rank, and frequency of the surname in Australia and the United Kingdom. This site has detail on the ethnicity of the surname as well as its meaning and origin. It also provides a list of variants and deviant surname spellings, and this is really helpful in pointing out some spelling errors you might not normally consider. Statistics are all well and good, and the accepted meaning and origin is a nice start, but how do we go beyond that statistical information? Well, our third stop is Ancestry.com. This section is in front of the paywall. Just type in www.ancestry.com forward slash learn forward slash facts. Ancestry uses the Dictionary of American Family Names from the Oxford University Press to provide the meaning of a surname. Ancestry provides additional information including distribution of the surname, immigration data, average life expectancy, occupation, civil war service, and the message board link, and that's Roots Web surname threads, for that surname. We get a teaser about how many records there are relating to our surname at Ancestry.com's website. Keep in mind that the information in these eight tabs is based on records that Ancestry maintains, but this is an excellent resource for surname research. Our last stop involves going beyond the computer, and this is a great time to remind ourselves that while so much is online and is being digitized every day, the vast majority of information is not online. It's available in book, map, image, and microfilm format at our libraries, archives, genealogical and historical society facilities, at our government offices, museums, university reading rooms, 
and in our attics and personal libraries. The Dictionary of American Family Names is a three-volume celebration of the surnames that make up our country's rich and varied heritage. This reference set is available at many regional and university libraries. Search for it on WorldCat. Why not check it out and learn a bit more about the surnames in your direct lines? And although Ancestry and American Surnames both use the dictionary as their source, they only use a snippet of the information available. Be sure to review the excellent series of articles in Volume 1 discussing the background to each of the various ethnic groups' surnames and the methodology of how the dictionary was prepared. These are the top 100 surnames in the United States, and they represent over 17% of the population. This is from the statistical report of the 2000 United States Census. The top 100 surnames have changed somewhat over time, and they follow our history. They started with British and French surnames, moved on to German, Scandinavian, and Irish surnames, then moved on to Spanish, Italian, Greek, as well as Southern and Eastern European surnames, and now we're seeing many Hispanic, Asian, and Middle Eastern surnames. Do you see your surnames here? Do you see any of the surnames from your worksheet? Two of my surnames make the list, Murphy and Butler. However, from my worksheet, three of my surnames are considered statistically irrelevant. Now, I'm not going to tell my grandmother that. And the other 11 are very far down on the list of 151,671 surnames that make up the statistical report. Any guesses on what the most common surname in the United States is? It's Smith, and it's registered with the Guild of One Name Studies. It's also one of the One Name Study websites I included on your worksheet. Be sure to take a look at the site. It goes to show you that you can do a very large One Name Study, and it also shows you the power of a DNA project. Before you start a One Name Study, you'll want to check to see if that surname has already been done, or if anyone is currently studying that surname. To see if a surname is already a registered One Name Study, or a surname of interest, go to the Guild website at www.one-name.org and do a surname search. If the surname is registered and there's a profile, you'll be able to find out the status of the One Name Study, who to contact for more information, and whether you might want to collaborate with that One Name researcher. If the surname is not registered, it might be listed as a surname of interest. Again, you'll be able to find contact information. This is my Kia One Name Study profile on the Guild website. You can easily add information about your study, update the status of your study and the data you've collected, include your links, and an alias email contact. I've not registered the surnames of Elwood and Tracy, but I am interested in them in a particular area and time frame. That information is included also on the Guild website, so if someone searches for one of those surnames, they could contact me, and we could either work together or I could share all my information with them. If you're thinking of starting a One Name Study, you should also get a feel for the size of the project that you're taking on. You'll want to decide upon the primary surname, consider whether to include any variants, and determine the geographic coverage of your study. Let's take a look at each step in a bit more detail because size matters. One Name Studies come in all shapes and sizes, and the best way to get a sense of the amount of work ahead is to determine the frequency of your surname. To get a sense of the surname over time, you'll want to do this analysis using historical census data. If you're starting in the United States, check out the federal censuses from 1790 to 1940, and then include the statistical data from the 2000 census. Then take a look at the frequency of your surname in the potential countries of origin or migration. Before we get into the frequency analysis, how do you decide which surname to study? On your worksheet, you'll see the Choosing a Surname box with a four-part test, and this is just the way that I approached it. If you have your heart set on a particular surname and it fails this test, 
No worries. As long as you understand the potential difficulties, you should just go ahead and study it. The first thing I did was remove any surname that was already registered with the Guild of One Name Studies or was part of a known One Name Study. If a study was ongoing, I didn't feel the need to reinvent that wheel. I could just provide my data to that One Name researcher. The second thing I did was remove surnames that had barriers associated with them. This included the Scandinavian patronymic or matronymic surnames because I would be studying a surname that was based on a parent's given name, which I didn't really feel I had any connection to. In addition, I removed the Slovenian surnames. I don't read or write Slovenian, and Slovenian records are difficult to access due to its location and its treatment during and after World War I and World War II. The third thing I did was remove any surnames that were so large in frequency that the study would be overwhelming, or so small in frequency that the study wouldn't have a sufficient amount of data to really make it an interesting project. I call this the Goldilocks issue too big, too small, too hot, too cold, you get the idea. I was left with two surnames, and once you go through this process, you might have more or even fewer to choose from. I made my final choice based on the surname that I had the closest connection to, my grandfather's surname. And the fact that the majority of my work would be in North America and Ireland, and that the records would be in English and sometimes Latin. You can determine surname frequency in three steps using the census for whichever country is applicable to you. I use both FamilySearch.org and Ancestry.com to search for the census record collection because it operates as a bit of a check to make sure that those results are in sync. Take the results of the search and input that data into a spreadsheet and then do a quick analysis of the data. Now let's see this in practice. Here I'm using FamilySearch.org and I search by surname with a check mark for exact spelling. I limit the record collection based on the country I want to work with, here the United States. Go to the Collections tab and select the Census and Lists section. Show all the results and then select the applicable data, here the Federal U.S. Census data. You can use any spreadsheet program. I happen to use Microsoft Excel. Put the census year in the columns, so that runs across the top. Put the surnames in the rows, running up and down. Input the occurrences, or the numbers, for the surnames in the appropriate cells. Already, just by seeing these numbers, I can answer certain questions. When did my surname arrive in the country? Were there waves of immigration? Does my surname appear on the slave schedules or the 1890 veteran schedule? Has my surname increased or decreased over time, both in number and as a percentage of the total population? This type of preliminary analysis also gives me a good sense of the amount of work I have ahead of me. Finally, highlight the columns and rows with data and click on Quick Analysis. You can play with the color and the style options for a chart. Right away, I have a great visual for the frequency of my primary surname and variants, as well as a reminder of the census data I need to include with my One Name study. I did this same analysis for Newfoundland, Canada, Ireland, England, Scotland, and Wales. Now I have a good sense of the amount of work in each country, as well as the geographic order, from small to large, that I might want to approach my study. The websites listed here, and on your worksheet, all have data on censuses and civil registration, or vital statistics, to help you find out your surname's frequency and ranking. Another excellent website is www.mooseroots.com, which provides links to foreign government census sites for the most recent statistical data. Once you've done the frequency analysis and have chosen the primary surname and any variants, you're ready to proceed with your one name study. Now the question is, how do you actually go about doing one? Three excellent resources for the nuts and bolts of conducting a one name study are, first, 
a booklet called The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, The Art of One Name Studies, published by the Guild of One Name Studies. Second, the wiki on the Guild website. It expands on the booklet by providing not only the methodology and technology resources, but also location information, resources and record sets in various countries that are useful in gathering data. And third, The Surnames Handbook by Debbie Kinnett, a book published in 2012. You can check for it on WorldCat to find it at a library location or online to purchase it. In addition, and also free, which is one of my favorite things, the state research guides on Ancestry.com are excellent for understanding the history as well as the scope and types of records available in each of the states in the United States. And the Family Search Wiki is a very good source of information about countries, states, and local jurisdictions, and the wiki includes links to the actual record collections Family Search maintains to get you right into those records and indexes. As to these seven steps, let's take a look at each in turn, and keep in mind that this is not a steady progression. It's more like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, dancing up, down, and back up again. And you'll be doing that same thing while working on your One Name study. The first step is collecting all references to the surname wherever it is found. You might start local, a community or town, and over time continue to expand your scope. One of the easiest ways to collect data today is through online records and indexes. You can download data today in a matter of moments that previously took months or years of visits to record offices. Whether you use census or civil registration indexes, the Social Security Death Index, Find a Grave, Obituary, or Newspaper Search Results, you can easily collect substantial information with some focused searches online. Take advantage of the export feature in Family Search when you're working with collections. It's a simple process to download a comma separated value, that's known as a CSV format, which will be saved in whatever spreadsheet program you use. You can choose 20, 50, or 75 records at a time and download the information that has been indexed together with the link to the record. This is a great start to the data collection process. One of the best export functions is at freebmd.org.uk. These are the general record office indexes for England and Wales. You can search by surname and download all of the data in one CSV file or break them down in any method that you want to use. Again, a great start to record collection and your spreadsheet can be expanded to contain complementary material. There's no prescribed way to work on a one name study. Some one name study researchers are data collectors, others are family reconstructors, and some of us engage in a combination of both strategy. We're the path crossers. We just looked at data gathering by collection. Now let's take a quick look at family reconstruction. Someone named study researchers begin their family reconstructions based on their own personal research or someone getting in touch with them to provide information or ask questions. Others start with a particular census and then do the same type of research we do for our own personal genealogy. Follow the family back and forth in the census, adding in vital statistics and any other records and indexes they can locate online. Again, I'm using Family Search here and limiting my search to the 1900 census. I could further limit my search to a particular state and work on one state at a time. As you can see, we can download the indexed information to a CSV file. We could click through to the details and download a copy of the census to our computer. We could start a family tree at Family Search and attach the information and the record. Whether you work in an online tree or input the data into a genealogy management program is up to the individual one name researcher. At various points in the data collection process, one name researchers start the analysis process. Whether it's using maps and gazetteers, apps or software to plot the surname location and migration, using statistics to determine the frequency of a surname over time and place, or starting a DNA project, 
This is where the fun starts, because a one name study is not a data entry exercise. Synthesis is all about using your one name study results, and that's steps one and two, to draw a preliminary conclusion or two about your surname and create added value. Your one name study can go in any direction you choose to take it. Whether you want to learn about the socioeconomic status, migration, immigration, military service, religious affiliation, occupation, education, health-related issues, or causes of death, or perhaps the famous or the infamous who share your surname, you can follow any course of inquiry. It's all up to you and your particular interests. How to spread the word about your one name study and perhaps interest co-researchers or those who share your surname. You might want to use a blog or dedicated website. I have six examples of one name study sites I listed on your worksheet. Whatever you do, be sure to shout it from the genealogical rafters that you have a one name study. Let's take a quick look at two of the sites. This is a great way to draw attention to your one name study. Include the famous or the infamous on your home page. Bob Cumberbatch has an interesting and easy to navigate website for his one name study. And although his surname has British origins, he has expanded his research to include records from among other places, France and Barbados. The FitzHenry blog has the results of a mapping project of the FitzHenrys in the 1901 and 1911 Irish census. In her blog, Jo FitzHenry explains in detail how she went about using Google Earth and the Irish census data to put together these maps. This is the type of project that anyone working on a one name study could do. And if you have a DNA project for your one name study, be sure to put it front and center as Joe does to encourage others to join in. From time to time with a one name study, you'll get questions. Usually people want to know if you have their family in your study, or if you've found connections among people in certain parts of a country, or if you've been able to take your research across the pond. Sometimes people will offer to share their data or they might offer to work with you on your one name study. Not only is it polite to respond to inquiries, it's the only requirement if you register your one name study with the Guild. If you're doing all this work, you'll certainly want to share the results with other researchers and the public. The key is to be out there. Whatever format you choose, an article, book, website, or data compilations, send your study results out into the world. And don't wait until you're finished, because you'll probably never be finished unless your surname is so small or dying out. If you work in stages or by regions or countries, take the time to publish your findings, your stories, images, and how you went about that section of your study. Others will learn from your experiences, and we all benefit for sharing our methodology and results. Whether over the short term, with backups, paper copies, or scans, or long term, a published study, an archive study, perhaps a will or trust directive, you should safeguard your work and preserve it. Planning for the future means your one name study will have a future. You can place your study in an online tree, archive it, or find a co-researcher who's willing to take the lead sometime in the future. If you're thinking about starting a one name study or expanding your one name study from the area you're currently researching, but it also seems just a bit intimidating or even completely overwhelming, you don't have to go it alone. Whether you work by yourself or in a small group or with a large society, you can also join the Guild of One Name Studies. The tent card tells you a bit about who the Guild is, what it does, and the services and benefits of membership. The Guild is a registered charity in England and Wales, and its mission is to inform and educate those interested in surname research and One Name Studies. That includes both the general public and the Guild's members. There's lots of information in front of the paywall on the Guild website, and the Guild's YouTube channel has recordings of its seminars, conference presentations, and monthly Google Plus Hangouts that are freely available to the public. 
There's no requirement to register a surname if you join the guild, and about 25% of guild members have not registered a surname. In fact, I was a member of the guild for four years before I registered my surname. I found membership helpful when I was starting my surname research, specifically the guild wiki and the quarterly journal. I think the biggest benefit is the other one-name researchers, and there are over 350 North American guild members and a total of 2,700 guild members worldwide. They're able to answer my questions, give me a heads up on resources and record sets, and they look out for instances of my surname wherever they are located. In fact, every week I receive obituaries, newspaper articles, and heads up on different record sets. Recently I found out about the Australian convict records, which have been digitized and indexed. They're available online, and unsurprisingly, there are several keos to be found in that record set. If you have any specific questions about your surname or how to get started with a one name study, feel free to contact me through any of the contact information listed here today and I'll be happy to follow up with you. Thanks so much for watching this presentation and if you do nothing else, please include the meaning and origin of your surnames as a fact and source it in your personal or online trees. Do it for your own surname and for the surnames you listed on your worksheet. And please post to the Surnames community on Google Plus how close you got with the categories and countries for each of your surnames on your worksheet and whether there were any surprises. The Surnames community on Google Plus is an open community for anyone interested in surname research or one name studies. There are also surname groups that you might want to check out both on Google Plus and Facebook. I hope I've encouraged some of you to take the plunge and start or continue a one name study. Because one name studies and one name researchers are all about bringing the world together one surname at a time.